Welcome to another episode of Teen Minds Redefine, where we try to redefine the relationships we have with our teenagers. We want to foster them into growing into their own true authentic selves as we support and coach as opposed to demand and control. And today we are talking about empowering parents, navigating body image, food freedom, and parental influence over that. And I have a beautiful guest, Jane Pilger, is a compassionate advocate empowering women who struggle with food-related challenges to discover food freedom and cultivate body trust, and with a deep understanding of the complexity surrounding disordered eating and body image issues, Jane guides women on a transformative journey from battling their bodies to embracing them as allies. Drawing upon her expertise in neuroscience, trauma-informed care, and compassionate coaching, Jane helps her clients unlock the missing link between their behaviors and their inner struggles. Her mission is to provide women with the tools and support they need to develop self-trust, understand their behaviors, and create a safe and nurturing relationship with food and their bodies. And I'm so excited to have Jane here. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Me too. I think there's just so much, there's so much to talk about when it comes to, to body image, but I think, can we start with, your definition of body image can we start with like what is disordered eating what is what let's define it first for people yeah so body image i mean really to to just simplify it as much as possible body image really is your collection of thoughts and beliefs about your body i mean it's as simple as that yeah yeah and as far as disordered eating you know we could get into the the dsm-5 the 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 manual that really very specifically goes in and diagnoses the various um eating disorders and their their characteristics and all of that and i don't i yes i think in some cases it is important and it isn't and it is necessary but to me if if we just look at overall disordered eating what is disordered eating disordered eating is when anyone has a relationship with food that impacts their overall day-to-day -day life their quality of life the way that they show up in the world um is the the relationship kind of between themselves food and their bodies it is negatively impacting life in some way would you consider eating disorders in the same category as self-harm i don't and the reason that i don't is i mean I, it's a good question and and i would say this i think that um eating disorders and I, I mean, I guess I, I, I'm not as familiar with self-harm as I am with disordered eating. So in terms of, I, I certainly do not consider myself to be, you know, an expert on the the subject of self-harm. I I do think in terms of self-harm, sometimes self-harm comes in like a, from a an attempt to find relief in some way. Um, sometimes when people think about self-harm, they think it's like an intent like an intent the, and when i said i don't initially is is my brain was going to this place of the idea of i am harming myself intentionally like the intent to harm and i do not believe that that eating disorders are come from a place of intent to harm so sometimes people who suffer from disordered eating particularly um let's say with binge eating for example they might um, eat a lot of food and they might just think like, oh, I hate myself. I hate myself so much. I hate that I do this. And they feel like they're eating kind of to punish themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's but I really don't think it is an intent or an attempt to self harm. I think more like more often what happens is that there's so much internal self-judgment and yeah. self-loathing that we're not trying to hurt ourselves we're not trying to punish ourselves we're trying to 
get away from ourselves. There's so much the the internal language and the dialogue is so mean and it's so pervasive, but we can't, we literally cannot get away from it unless we do something that completely disconnects ourselves from ourselves. And for many people with disordered eating, they have figured out a way to use food in some way to to kind of create that disconnection from from okay. self They're and not, i think that's more likely what happens there and that makes sense it only it actually just occurred to me like 10 minutes i wonder if it's the same mm. i wonder if so can you go over the categories or or i don't know itemize what eating disorders or disordered eating is i know there's bulimia but what is there what else is there what is it briefly what does it look like Oh, well, that's a that's a really big question. And I he, personally, I don't really consider myself to be an expert in all eating disorders. Mm -hmm. um, my, for me, binge eating, binge eating is, is my lived experience, both restrictive. I've, I have I've kind of experienced I've experienced three different levels. So you have the more restrictive type of eating disorders, which um, when can be an anorexia nervosa um, and restrictive, just restrictive types of eating disorders, which is we are restricting the amount of food that we eat. Mm -hmm. There's also then binge, there's binge eating, binge eating disorder where we're consuming large amounts of food at any given time. Mm -hmm. There's also with binge eating, sometimes there is an attempt to compensate for the amount eaten and sometimes there isn't so when there's an attempt to compensate for the amount eaten that might look like bulimia where maybe somebody is trying to um pur purge in some way so whether that's through vomiting whether it's through laxatives whether it's through excessive exercise kind of an attempt to um to compensate for the overconsumption. in some cases there isn't an attempt to compensate for the overconsumption. There are also different kind of areas. There's, there is, if, if we're looking at the DSM-5, the, the diagnostic manual, mm -hmm. there is um, the eating disorders not otherwise specified. So if it doesn't fall into these categories, there, it, it, there's kind of a, there can be a catch-all um, for, there's, there's a lot of different areas where there might just be a, hyper focus on the quality of food. So this is very, this is something that's happening a lot more lately is kind of this emphasis on, uh, you have probably heard the term clean eating, yeah. where we have this hyper focus on the quality, either the quality of the food, um, it has to be organic, it has to be unprocessed, it has to be whole, there has to be, there, there can be this real fixation on the, the type of food. Mm -hmm. So that can also be kind of a, a category. If, if you are, if you are a person who has a hard time going to, for example, if you have a hard time going to um, a potluck where you mm -hmm. don't really know what's going to be there, there's going to be a lot of, you know, you don't really have control. There's going to be maybe 10 different things. People are just going to be bringing things. If you're one of those people that's like, I don't even like to go to those things because I can't control what's in my food. I don't know what's in every single ingredient. Um, those types of things are, are kind of good indicators. There might be some sort of, uh, there might be some sort of disordered eating happening. Okay, that's interesting. So are there, are there misconceptions around disordered eating? Yes, um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions around disordered eating. There are, for example, um, one of the one of the the misconceptions I think that 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 I would receive a lot is people would look at me and they would say, "You, you, there's no way you could have an eating disorder because if you looked at me from the outside, I'm a straight sized, average sized." person mm -hmm. and so somebody might look at me and be like there's there's no way that you could be that you could you know be a binge eater like you're not there's kind of this idea that to have 
for example, to have binge eating disorder, that you would be very overweight. Or, you know, so the, the misconception is this. The misconception is that you can just look at somebody and be able to tell whether or not they have an eating disorder. Yeah. So basically, you can have no matter what, no matter what size you are, you can have an eating disorder. You can, you can have, you can have anorexia and be clinically in, in the obese category. Wow, uh, I did not know that. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Yes. There are a lot of people who generally like live in larger bodies. They genetically are just, you know, just like dogs. We all are designed to have a different size and shape of frame of, of body. But what happens is that we we end up seeing all these images and who is portrayed on TV and in the movies and in the magazines. And we think, oh, that, that is the standard of beauty. That's the body I want. So what we do is we, we suppress where our body naturally wants to be. So you might have a woman who just lives in a naturally larger body. The natural size that her body wants to be is larger, but because she has received all of these these messages from society that the 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 beauty ideal is thinner she is eating very much less food than her body requires because mm -hmm. she's trying to suppress her natural body size so she literally could check off many of the the indicators for anorexia restrictive eating disorder but be but nobody else would be able to would really even think that's possible because she's in a bigger body you kind of like we have these ideas of an anorexic person and like a lot of people have this mental image of what that body might look like yeah. and that is not always the case that's really interesting and yeah. i can't be the first to think i had no idea yeah no you I are definitely not the first to think that at all yeah. And, and it, this becomes a problem because if you are this woman who is in a naturally has a naturally bigger body and then you go to the doctor and you tell them, you know, Hey, here, here are the challenges that I'm facing. Here's what's going on. And I'm not even eating that much food. What happens in a lot of cases is the doctor is like, I don't, there's no way I don't believe you. There's no way you could be in that size of body and not be eating very much food, which then just reinforces for her, there must be something wrong with me. I must be broken. My body needs to change. And so I'm just gonna keep essentially starving myself because I'm trying to manipulate my body to be this thing that I believe is better. I mean, that really disordered eating, disordered eating can, and and any of our eating challenges can really come from a lot of different places. So I believe that there are there are really eight reasons kind of behind, at least for when when I talk about the eight reasons, but it's specifically for binge eating, but a lot of these reasons really um they they cross over to really any sort of disordered eating or any challenges any challenges with food. And so those reasons, number one, it's shame and judgment. Shame and judgment over, particularly when we're talking about binge eating, it's like there's so much shame and there's so much judgment when you just feel so out of control with mm -hmm. food. Like you just feel like you can't stop and that there really must be something wrong with me because of just the sheer volume of food that I'm eating. And when we're in shame and judgment, then all we want to do is kind of like get away. We want to, we want to escape. We want to hide. We want to hide from ourselves. We want to hide from other people. We don't want to kind of like hear that um, the, the loathing, whether that's coming from somebody else or from ourselves internally. Mm -hmm. So that can kind of just like keep us in the cycle. But restriction is for binge eating. Restriction is, is one of the main kind of factors and causes. So what can happen is sometimes for some people, and this has absolutely been the case for me, I have I have had both restrictive eating tendencies and also binge eating 
um, binge eating tendencies. So it's like, you know, you kind of have the restrictive eating, the extreme dieting, the, Mm -hmm. you know, the calorie counting, the trying to, you know, only eat one time a day or, you know, have these very long extended windows where we don't eat or we cut out entire food groups or these types of things. The often when we do that, we end up eating way less food than our body actually needs. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens as a survival mechanism, the body is very smart. It knows exactly what it needs. It's going to ultimately at some point say, fine, if you're not going to feed me, I'm going to get the food that I need no matter what from some place. And this is often what ends up kind of starting the binge eating cycle where you literally feel like you have no control. You cannot stop eating. And it's like, it's your body's response to that. That's that essentially that threat of that threat of, of starvation. And that kind of keeps it in a cycle, but that's not the only reason that some people start. It, it's, it is one of the main reasons, but then there's also one of the other reasons is nervous system dysregulation. So if you are, let's say you experienced some sort of trauma in your life of any type, a lot of people have, have realized that they can, food can very much be a coping mechanism. It can soothe a dysregulated nervous system, whether that was trauma, whether they needed to escape and disconnect for some other reason to protect and, and help themselves we kind of learn how to disconnect through food. And so then that can kind of become a starting point. So that can be part of it, disconnecting, just disconnection from the body in general. Mm -hmm. A lot of people kind of live from the neck up. We're kind of just all, I also very much resonate with this. We're just in our minds all the time. We're not actually in our bodies. And so when we're in our minds and our nervous system is dysregulated, we end up using food to kind of, number one, stay disconnected, but then mm-hmm. also to try to kind of calm, calm ourselves down. Yeah. Hence comfort we, food. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Why we call it comfort food. And that's then the, the fifth reason is it's a coping mechanism. Yeah. So if we don't have a large, what I call your emotional capacity. So your emotional capacity is your capacity to be with any emotion. And many of us just didn't learn this. I didn't growing up. And Mm -hmm. so when I would experience these, you know, kind of big emotions, when I was in high school, I would just go to my room and slam the door and I would just be pissed. And I wish so much that I could remember what I did when I went in my room and slammed the door, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would come out the next day. We would never talk. We wouldn't talk about it. It would just be as if nothing ever happened. And so when I went to college, I'm experiencing all these very big emotions. I'm also away from my primary, my friends, my family, my attachments. And I didn't know what to do with all of this stuff. And so that I start my very first binge was my first semester in college, which is very common. And um, what I realized was that for me, binging became, it was like the way that I slammed the door on myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, only later in treatment did I really realize that's what I was doing because I didn't have any other mecha- I didn't have any other ways to deal with my emotions. I didn't even, I, I just didn't have that skill. We also, another, another reason, reason number six is it's an attempt to control. We're trying to control either our bodies. This is often the case, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, the size of our body, we're trying to control exactly what we eat what you know we don't eat how much we weigh all of that we're just trying to control everything or sometimes we feel if we feel like everything else in life is just very out of control if i can control my food if i can control exactly all of the things it can it's just a, it's an attempt to control especially when things feel a little out of control ultimately you do something over and over again it becomes a habit so that's mm-hmm. reason number 7 And then the eighth reason is your personal narrative. It's the way you talk to yourself about yourself. So if I'm thinking, and then this kind of even then comes back to the whole body image discussion, right? It's like, if I am just constantly saying to myself, you're gross, you're disgusting, you, you know, you're fat, 
you need to lose weight, what you need to, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. like all of that also, it compounds everything. Because again, if I'm saying all these bad things to myself, I just, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. I want to get away. And now what I've learned to do over time and over the years is to get away from myself with food. That's how I slam the door. It's how I, the Mm -hmm. other analogy I use is like, it's like, it's how I turn the lights off on myself. And, and some people use something else to turn the lights off on themselves, Mm -hmm. right? That, that disconnecting from our self, our experience, our internal dialogue. It's something that, you know, we do in a lot of different ways. Some people use food to do that. And some people, you know, kind of use other, other things. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how do we, is there a point where, and I'm thinking now I'm thinking moms looking at their kids as well. I mean, how do we influence that at home? What are we Mm -hmm. saying? Like if our kids looking at uh, Taylor Swift, our kids looking at, what are we saying? Like, I don't know what I would, I don't like you're beautiful from the inside out, whatever it is. I, I don't know what I would, what I had said to my kids. Um, but what, what are we saying at home when they're looking at these pictures, when they're admiring, when they're, what are we saying? What are the messages we need to be giving them? Well, I think there's a couple of things to think about in terms of like what happens at home and particularly for moms. The first question that I think is important to ask is for yourself as a mom, what relationship do you have with your own body? Mm. And what I know is true for a lot of people, particularly moms, is they moms work very hard to not pass on the type of messages that they inherited. And and I do believe we are doing a much better job than Mm -hmm. we used to. We are getting many more messages. We have many more um, varied sizes of um, role models and of of people. It's still very much challenging, but it is better than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So, and I think a lot of moms are very aware of this. They are aware of the messages and they they work very hard to instill in their children, you're beautiful no matter what, and, and, and work on instilling those. But here's where I see the disconnect. They work very hard on what they say to their children while still having their own very challenging relationship with themselves. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like the, you know, do what I say, not what I do. Our kids know when we have challenging relationship with food and with our bodies our kids know this shows up in if you are if you are a parent who does not want to be in pictures your kid knows it's why like this doesn't like you don't not want to be in pictures just for any reason other than you do not like the way that you look Mm -hmm. so so there's that like that's a that's a huge one if you are eating different food than the rest of your family eats, uh, you know, because you are trying to lose weight or whatever reason, um, that is also a very big indicator. Mm -hmm. If you go to the beach or you go to the pool and you sit and you don't wear a bathing suit, you don't get in the water, or you just simply refuse to go do those things, these are also, these are the the silent but very uh, simultaneously silent and very loud messages that we send to our children so i think that's where it's like as a parent more than what you say to your kids because i i really do believe that most parents are pretty aware um because it's like i don't want there's it's uh, there i often hear I don't want to give my child the same message that I received from my parents. And a lot of times that message was, you know, taking them to a Weight Watchers meeting at 10 years old or literally saying, if uh, if you have seconds, nobody's going to want to marry you or, you know, you you are you as the bigger child, you don't get dessert, but the other kids do. Like those are examples of things that 
30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. parents were doing directly. So th I don't think that is happening as much anymore. It probably still does to some extent. Yeah. But, but if you have a challenging relationship with food and with your body, that it's the, the best thing we can do is work on our own relationships and show our children what that looks like and, and, and really be that example rather than just trying to say yeah. the right thing. So if we're, when do we get worried? When are we looking at our kid going, hmm, we need to, we need to, and there's going to be steps, I'm sure. We need to have this conversation and then maybe we need to notch it up and maybe now we need some perfect, what are the steps where mom or dad is going, uh-oh, yeah. this is yeah. yeah, sometimes the steps actually even start before, sometimes food isn't even part of it in the beginning. Sometimes it is. But it's, I would say, if a child is um, very, if they're, if they're very, like, closed off, if they are, if, if their behavior changes in a significant way, let's say, especially, um, especially with, like, restrictive type of eating, when you, when you are not eating enough to meet your basic like caloric needs in life, certain things are going to happen, like um, your overall mood might change. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have naturally been like a pretty outgoing person. And then all of a sudden, not even all of a sudden, but over time, your maybe your affect changes, maybe what you're interested in changes, maybe you used to be interested in going out and now you're not really anymore, that type of thing. Sometimes that can happen first. Um, but absolutely around food, it, it, you can kind of look at, are there changes in the way that, are there changes in the way that they're, that they're eating? Are mm -hmm. there changes in the foods that they are willing to eat or not willing to eat? Mm -hmm. Is there, a, is there an increased or hyper, uh, focus on the type of food, the quality of food. Um, are you seeing them kind of like uh, maybe not wanting, if we're talking the restrictive type, are we, is there an increase in, you know, kind of like not wanting to eat or there there's more kind of challenges around actual mealtime? Um, we can definitely look at significant changes in body size in either either direction really um and also when we're talking about teens our bodies are designed to get bigger we are supposed to until we're probably i think about 20 our body is supposed to get bigger so if you're seeing somebody who is like exhibiting kind of some concerns around eating maybe is not eating as much maybe they're um maybe they're not wanting to talk about food where you know there there's you're seeing kind of just certain things around that and you're not seeing kind of you're not seeing a, a change in in the body that may mm -hmm. also be a sign sometimes sometimes as what's really interesting in terms of disordered eating and when disordered eating can really pick up for people is especially in women it happens at these periods of life where our hormones are changing significantly so it might be in the teen years when maybe a um a person is is just getting her period so we've got those hormonal changes which come with changes in the body and they can be very they can feel very threatening and it's often when some girls go on their first very restrictive diet because they start to see these changes in their body. They don't like it mm -hmm. and they, they're kind of trying to prevent it. So sometimes disordered eating um, can really ramp up at that point. The next point really can be right around college for similar reasons that, you know, that was for me because we're away from 
our support. If, if, if you, if you go away to college, Mm -hmm. you're away from your support, you're away from, in often cases, your friends, you're really having to kind of adult on your own for the first time and do a lot of things on your own. You're also in charge of your food and your choices for the first time completely. So there's a lot going on there that can also be a, a heightened time for disordered eating. And interestingly, the next time that that there is a, a large prevalence of disordered eating is in the perimenopause, menopause time for women. Yep. And it's because our hormones are changing so much. I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of this right now. It's like, not only do I know my hormones are changing for a lot of reasons, but my body has also, it has changed. We're supposed to gain weight at this time of life. We're supposed to get softer. We are supposed to gain weight, but there's this idea and you see these, you know, influencers or whoever on Instagram with these rock hard hard bodies at 50. And then we think, well, that's what I'm supposed to look like. And so all of this is a problem. And so now I've got to go do all of these things to try to change my body. And if you think about many of many women who are in that perimenopause, menopause time of life, where their own bodies are changing, they likely have children, depending, I mean, we all have children at different times of life, but they might have children who are in the teen or kind of college age years. So not only is their body changing, but then if you just imagine kind of the the influence that's happening there while you there the the mom is now dealing with her changing body and how she's dealing with it and responding to it and reacting to it is very likely going to be it's going to be seen mm-hmm. by the child and then the child then you know it's kind of not only do they have that influence but you also have all the other kids at school you have everything else that we see in the media, on TV, in the movies, everything else. Yeah, I hear you. And and I'm, yeah, all the conversation I think I have in my own head. And I think actually talking to you a couple of weeks ago, you said yeah. exactly that your body is supposed to do these things. Yes. And it really, it, it has sat with me since you said yes. that. So I'm glad you said it. I'm glad you said it again, because my, yeah, my body is is so different now I yes. look and I'm like, oh my gosh, but, but I feel really good. Yeah. I feel, I, you know, I, I'm careful with what I'm eating, but I, but I, when I'm eating, I feel good about what I'm eating. And when I'm, you know, cheat day, whatever that is, it's not because I feel like it's a cheat day. I feel like the energy around, oh, I really feel like this pizza today. And I really feel like this glass of wine. And, and it's an energy. It's not a, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. And that's okay. I'll be good for the rest of the week. And, but I don't yeah. do that anymore. Yeah. The Just energy behind that conversation yes. is yeah. really yes. important. Yes. The energy behind our choices is everything. And the, even the idea of a cheat day, it's so problematic, right? Because it's like, what are we cheating on? I mean, the the rules and the restrictions and the rigidity and all of that, like it just, it sets us up for, it literally sets us up for like these disordered eating patterns. Yeah. And so even it's like as a, as like to go back to the question of as a mom, what do we do? Ask yourself, like ask yourself these questions. Am I using any of these words around food? Am I saying bad or good. I've been good. I've been so good today. I've been so good all week. Am I saying I deserve this? I deserve to have pizza. I've been so good. Mm. Am I using things like cheat day, right? Like it's, it's, it's a term that so many people have used and, Mm. but the term in and of itself is problematic. Mm. Am I uh, looking at a menu and saying, Oh, well, I really should order this, but I've had a really hard day, so I'm going to get this. Am I saying, well, I should be good, but I'm going to be bad. 
and I'll be better tomorrow. Yeah. Like, you know, like just even kind of like those types of things, the way that we talk about food matters yeah. because all of those things, what they do is they create morality around food. It's good and it's bad. And if there are good choices and bad choices, then what we do is we end up saying, well, if I didn't make the good choice, then I must be bad. Mm -hmm. We personalize it and we then think I'm bad for doing that. Now, I mean, if I ate pizza all day, every day, I would just feel gross. I just, I would not feel good in my body, but that doesn't make it bad food. Yeah. So the way that I love to talk about food and like eating, like just decisions around eating is, is, is I kind of have a threefold approach, nurturing, supportive, and sustainable. Mm -hmm. So is this choice nurturing? Nurturing might be, uh, it might be ice cream on a warm summer day. I mean, that may be very nurturing to me. Mm -hmm. It might be something completely different. Like nurturing does not have to mean, you know, it is 100% healthy and whole and all those things, right? Mm -hmm. Nurturing, is it supportive? Is it supportive for whatever I am looking for food to do for me in this moment? Mm -hmm. Because I think food can absolutely can and does serve a lot of purposes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people say like, uh, I just want food to be fuel and that's it, nothing else. But, you know, I, I personally, I think that food has a, has a lot of places. Yes, food absolutely is fuel. F food does fuel a lot of what we do in life, and that's really important. And food is also pleasurable. Food is for gathering and for celebration yeah. and for enjoyment. It, it absolutely can be all of those things. So for me, it's nurturing, supportive. And the last one is so important, and it's sustainable. Can I eat this way for the rest of my life? Mm. There's not a, like, I'm not on a, you know, plan that I can, I can only do for 30 days or, you know, 75 days or, you know, three weeks until then, you know, I'm off the wagon or whatever. It's like sustainable. I literally, no matter what, no matter if I'm having the best day ever or the worst day ever, like this is what I can do kind of for myself. It's really like that supportive and sustainable approach yeah and i liked even how you started the whole conversation where you're you're in your head yes Whereas when you when you really think about eating and the same as what i just said it's like how does it make me feel yes and and literally i could yep go to mcdonald's and i could have fries and a burger and i know in an hour i'm gonna feel like a bag of crap and if yeah. i realize that but can I go to a really nice gourmet burger place? Can I have just this great, you know, just to kind of satisfy what I'm feeling like at that moment. And I'm not going to feel this mound of regret because I'm not sitting in the washroom with Tums. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I like that. And I, you know, I think that's conversations to have at home. Well, how, what do you, what do you literally, like we say, what do you feel like? Yeah. What do you feel yeah. like? Yeah. Yes. What do you really like? Think about it. What do you feel like? Hmm. And that's, I think, is so important. And I love, um, I just I want to respect the time of this, but I also want to say. I want to add one thing to that, though, real yeah, quick, in please. terms of like convert conversations to have at home. So I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And here's the thing that I think parents could do beautifully with their children. It's like, tell me, like really understanding around like food choices. Why do you like this food? What is it? What is it about this food that you really like? So it might be so because sometimes, especially especially if we're trying to make choices because, well, it's just the least amount of calories, right? Like at, this is if I eat this, then I'll weigh less tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? Like sometimes that's the decision. And if that's the decision, we want to know that. But it's like, if we can really understand why are we making these choices? What, it, what, huh? Okay. So like, what do you feel like? Oh, I feel like a salad. How come? What is it about a salad that would be like really amazing to you? And it might be, ah, oh, I just love some fresh produce right now. This is in season and mm -hmm. 
you know, when I eat a salad afterwards, like I just feel really good. I feel energized, whatever it is. Right. Or if, and if that's the answer, it's like amazing. If the answer is, well, I'm afraid that if I like what I really want is this, but I'm afraid if I eat this, then I won't be able to do this. Or I'm trying to fit into my prom dress, you know, because prom is in two weeks or whatever, like that right there is going to kind of be able to show you what are the decisions. Mm -hmm. It might be like, oh, well, I really want, um, I really want to eat. Like, I feel like, let's say it's like, fried chicken and mashed potatoes and biscuits and macaroni and cheese. Okay. Amazing. How come? Like, what is it about that? Like what sounds really good? Um, you know, like, what do you like about it? Like really, I love for anyone to really understand, like with your food choices, it's like, what do you like to eat and why? Yeah. So many people that I work with, they don't even know what they like to eat. They're just like, I have just eaten these foods for years because somebody told me to, they were on a list. They're like approved by any diet I've ever been on. This is just yep. like what I eat. And it's like, okay, well, let's get really like, do you even like that food? If you do, why? What do you like about it? Is it the texture? Is it the flavor? Do you like this brand or do you like this brand? Oh, I don't even know. Like I've never really given myself those options mm -hmm. so these are great conversations to have and if we're if we're back to the fried chicken and the mashed potatoes and the and the everything all right like we understand why okay great and then we start to think about i love to think about how i'm going to feel when i eat something before during and after yeah so it's like i'm i'm all for well actually i'm not for fried chicken and all mm -hmm. of those things because i would just not feel good but yeah. i might have some some of something but really with the i want to enjoy this i want to like enjoy the anticipation of it i want to enjoy it while i'm eating and i want to like feel really good afterwards as well mm -hmm. and there is a place where you can find that enjoyment in all of the areas and then you're not in the oh like i feel gross i ate too much i'm over full like if you really stay connected Mm -hmm. You have that intention, that purpose. You really are eating what you truly want, listening to your body's wisdom. Like it's, it is so possible to have this amazing connected relationship with yourself and with food. Yeah, that's so good. I just want to say one more thing because this is such a, a sticking point with me is commenting on people's bodies. Yes. It makes me crazy oh he's gotten bigger oh he's gotten smaller oh look i've lost 10 pounds oh oh he or she or whatever like just commenting period yeah Can you talk yes. to me? It, basically the uh, uh you know i really learned about i learned about the dangers of this I would say through my, I, I was, I went through um, intensive outpatient therapy, two, two rounds. And in my time in that um, treatment was when I really just learned about the dangers of commenting on bodies, mm -hmm. any, any comment at all, whether we're talking, whether we comment on somebody who's lost weight, whether we comment on somebody who's gained weight, number one, we never have any idea what is going on with anybody. But when I think about for myself specifically, when I was at the height of my restriction and my disordered eating, I received the most compliments on my body. So here's what happens is you receive these compliments on your body. You're doing this stuff, restrictively eating, doing things that literally are so like detrimental physically to your body then you receive these compliments oh, you look so great oh my gosh i wish my arms looked like that what are you doing so then what do i hear is keep going it's like that reinforcement and this happened to me and i have heard this from so many people it's like then we get this it's like this affirmation to continue with the disordered eating. And then it just continues and continues. And then at some point, if like for me, then the binging then comes back because there's this, it's, it's the pendulum effect of mm -hmm. uh, that is just natural 
for us, then the weight gain starts coming back on. And then there's just this fear. Oh my gosh, now I'm getting bigger. What are people going to say? Like it's this, it, it's, it's so problematic. Yeah. Commenting on bodies for any reason is never, it's never a good idea. Because we don't, you don't know, you don't know. Else. Like, right, if I'm, if I'm sitting on the couch and I'm listening to two people over here talk about, oh, she's gotten big or, oh, it's still filtering in my head. So there's still kids sitting on our couches yes. listening to mom and mom or mom and dad or dad and dad at the kitchen table saying, oh, my God, did you see him? What the hell? They're listening. Like, yes. we just need to, like, just put a dead stop right here. And full the, stop. And the, no more. Yes. No. And the message is that the size of your body matters and it doesn't. You are so much more than a body, but we keep getting these messages from external, from other people that the size and shape of your body is, is of this utmost importance. And so then we place all this importance on it. And then what do we know to do to change the shape of our body? Oh, food. So then it's it's just so inextricably linked. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My yeah. I just, I love this conversation. I think it's so important. I want people to share this everywhere because yeah. I feel like even in like my last few years of teaching, it was so prevalent in high school. And I don't know if it was more of a trigger from COVID or it just got more notice. Doesn't matter what, what it was it's there and we need to start talking about it we need to start stop the stigma around it we need to start having the right conversations instead of the wrong conversations and um yeah it's just i i feel like and this is not i'm just going to say this one quick thing this is not solely female gender no i'm not at all absolutely yeah. so i think it, absolutely it impacts it impacts both men and women and men it impacts men more than we know men don't really have a lot of times kind of a place to go to talk about these things but just like women see all of these ads and these you know women in bikinis and whatever men see the the muscle you know the muscly people on the magazines and in the movies and everything else they absolutely body image impacts both men and and women very on a on a very intense level in both cases and i just want to say one more thing in terms of the, the conversations to have mm -hmm. one more kind of like like a kind of just a warning especially for parents is what we want to do is understand we want to understand our kids help me understand why you're making these choices help me understand why you're afraid to eat that help me understand why uh, you know, you're not eating the lunch that I sent you or whatever, like help me understand is and and having that really understanding that curiosity, that openness is is so important. Here's here's the warning is we do not want to give them an indication of you're wrong. You're broken. There's something wrong with you. Why won't you just eat? Why don't you just stop eating? Why don't you just, just don't do that? Uh, just, you're beautiful. Why can't you just see? Why can't you just see how beautiful you are? Those things don't help. So we don't, they already, I can tell you already, they already feel broken. They already feel not good enough. They already feel challenged or damaged or something in some way. And so you want to be sure that you're not creating any more feelings of less than or wrong or broken because they are likely already feeling that in some way or another, or they wouldn't be kind of having some of these challenges. So what we want to do is understand. We want that compassion, that understanding, that, that empathy. And then through that understanding, okay, now let's, let's find you the support and the help. If, if that's, you know, kind of what we decide is that next step, but we don't want to go at it from this place of why don't you just do yeah. something different? Why can't you just eat more? Why can't you just eat a cheeseburger? Like that is not helpful.
I'm so glad we're finishing like this because help me understand, I think is the mic drop, like you've got all these golden nuggets today that are so helpful, but help me understand is yes. probably the best way to start any yes. conversation. Any conversation. I love that. I, I actually yes. had goosebumps when you said, I'm like, mm. there it is, there it is, yes. there it is right there. I yes. love it. Thank you so much. Yes. This, is, this is just so important and and we can drop into the show notes any resources you have i'm sure there's there's lots of places we can call talk to you books we can read i'll put it all in the show notes where can we find you jane sounds good um i would say uh, my website is janepilger.com a uh, great resource for um me specifically if you if binge eating is of concern for you or a loved one i have a podcast called binge breakthrough and even if i would say even if binging i actually received so much feedback that you know binging isn't actually my thing but i have challenges and struggles with food if you have any challenges or struggles with food, the Binge Breakthrough Podcast is a great uh, resource for you. What a great thing to have out there. Thank you for all the work you do. I really appreciate you dropping in. Hopefully we yes. can just have another conversation because I don't think this is over. And uh, thank you for listening to Teen Minds Redefined. Please share this. Please share this because people need to hear this. People need this help.